Mr. Chairman, this is Teresa. Good afternoon, Teresa. Can we begin? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And welcome to the Thursday, November 19th Public Planning Commission, Public Planning Committee meeting. Uh, I'd like them to call the meeting to order. Teresa, are we in compliance with FOIA? Yes, sir, we are. Thank you. And please call the uh, roll. Ms. Becker? Here. Mr. Stanford? Here. Mr. Ames? And I'm here also. Thank you, Teresa. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. And a second, second from Tammy. Thank you very much. Uh, all those in favor, just raise your right hand, please. Thank you. Carries unanimously. Um, are there any additions to the uh, agenda? If not, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. second. Yeah. All those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Thank you. Passes unanimously. All right. Mr. Chairman, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt. This is Teresa. Was that last motion, was that for the meeting minutes of October 23rd? Yeah, actually, uh, the first motion was for the minutes. The second me me motion was for the agenda. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for clearing that up. Okay. Teresa, um, do we have any public comments? Uh, yes, sir, we do. The public comments on the agenda items that were submitted electronically through the Open Town Hall portal uh, were submitted to the committee for review and made part of the official record. There was also a letter that was submitted um, that was also included in your packet of comments. Citizens were also provided the option to give comments on the phone um, during the meeting. We do have two citizens that were signed up to give comments. However, at this time, I see only one of those citizens on the line. Well, let's go ahead and hear that one citizen then, please. Okay, certainly. Mr. Ben Shelton, are you on the line? I am, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes, sir. thank you. Um, well, first of all, this is Ben Shelton with Shelton Law Firm. I represent concerned property owners um, with an ad hoc committee that is known as the Property Owners Protection Committee. I want to start off by thanking all of your good work for the town in general and for um, really um, listening to all constituents as to um, this ordinance, this proposed ordinance, the sea turtle provisions to the existing sea turtle ordinance. And I want to take time to also thank um, Ms. Kuhn. Um, I don't know if she's listening in on this, but I know that she does a lot of good work for the community. And I want to ensure that um, it is expressed from my um, client's point of view that that work is appreciated and the work of council is appreciated first and foremost. I understand, Mr. Chairman, that I have three minutes. Is there a way that I can request um, five minutes? Is that possible? Mr. Shelton, we really do comply with the three minutes, but I'll uh, extend it by one minute because you are giving us uh, compliments and recognizing people's efforts. So, so we'll thank start you with so much, minutes Mr. Chairman. Time. Bye. And I'd like to make ensure that the letter I sent today um, is made a part of the record for this meeting. Um, the I have reviewed the most recent revisions, and I believe that some of those revisions do somewhat tackle um, to a certain extent some of the concerns that are um, made uh, available in the letter that I've submitted. But I do not believe that all of them are made um, incorporated rather in those revisions. Specifically, um, I believe the council needs to be very careful with passing this proposed ordinance as it is written and drafted simply for this, the principal fact that it criminalizes homeowners conduct and homeowners actual enjoyment and use of their homes that they have built and purchased based on an existing ordinance. Um, this is not just a zoning ordinance. It's not a zoning ordinance really at all. It's a criminal ordinance. Um, violations of this ordinance are punishable up to 30 days in jail. They're also punishable for up to 
$500 fines, and those fines in that 30 days in jail can be recurring every single day of a violation, whether that's a violation of a perceived um, problem with a light fixture or a violation of some of the conduct that I describe in this letter um, that seems kind of speculative, quite frankly, and seems um, beyond um, reason, but unfortunately, I believe it actually is conduct that could be regulated under the existing ordinance. For example, having a dinner party outside where you have tiki torches outside, say a wedding or a family reunion, these property owners under this existing ordinance, that would be a criminal act. Um, having lights, um, um, candle lights inside their homes. Um, again, no one's going to walk around their home with a candle light, but under the existing ordinance, candle light is defined as an artificial light. And if someone is standing on the beach and can see that candlelight from inside a home, technically that's a violation of the ordinance. Now, we trust present town council and present um, staff to not enforce it to that far of an extension, but this ordinance, if passed, is going to be part of the town ordinance, part of town law. And we do not know what future council members are going to do. We do not know what future town staff is going to do. And we do not know also what future law enforcement agencies, whether it's Beaufort County Sheriff's Office or some other agency down the road, may do to um, my constituents, my clients, and a constituent and citizenship class of your, um, that you all represent um, in enforcing this ordinance. Um, I believe it's set forth in a letter, and I cannot go over through all the details and specificity, but there are significant issues with this. First of all, no homeowner, I don't care if you're a beachfront homeowner or any other homeowner, wants to be subject to um, a government agency or arms of a government agency peering into, looking into, and basically monitoring their personal conduct in their homes. Whether it's sitting out on the back porch and, watch, and, and reading a book under light, whether it's stay, sitting out on the back porch and watching a football game on a TV that's turned on, whether it's walking through their house with a flashlight, maybe they're disabled and not wanting to fall and trip, um, or walking through their backyard after um, 10 o'clock at night, which is something that folks may want to do, whether it's go to see the starlights or whatever else, um, with a flashlight. These things are technical violations, I believe, as I interpret the ordinance. Now, okay, I'm Selton, not going to go into we, possible we solutions here. If I'm, a, if I'm done with my three minutes, Mr. Ames, please let me yes. know. Yeah, you, you are. I am. Yeah. Uh, but, but thank you. Um, and uh, please, please review the letter I sent. Um, I know that you're doing good work, and I appreciate it on my property owners. Um, uh, the property owners I represent, I appreciate your work towards that effect. But I want to make sure that everyone understands that this is a very serious matter to them, and um, they've engaged me for this matter. Um, but they also want to seek um, a reasonable solution, and then they are not against protecting the sea turtles. That is not what this is about. It's about making sure that the town makes the right decision, and it's based on actual um, non-biased scientific research and studies. You have to show a nexus to um, infect such a um, what may be a drastic um, restriction on property owners' rights and use. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate the thank extra you, time. Um, and yes, your letter is a part of the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I'll talk to you later, thank I'm you. sure. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Mr. Chairman, we also have Ken Campbell on the line to speak. Mr. Fine. Campbell, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, Ken. Yes, I am. We can hear Hello. You. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, this is Ken Campbell, uh, and uh, again, addressing the uh, turtle ordinance. And first, uh, 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 let me thank uh, each of you for your service as council members. I know it's very time consuming and your service on this very important committee. Uh, my wife and I have been uh, visitors to Hilton Head for 47 years. We've been residents for 12 years. And uh, for background, we are very fortunate to have a resident that does about our beautiful beach on our barrier island. We believe that every one of us has a responsibility to be a good steward of our environment and to pass it on to future generations better than we have experienced it. We have donated in the past to save endangered gopher tortoises and have had family, and our family has experienced uh, the wonders of turtles 
We're eating their nests and hatchlings making their way from those nests to the water on our beaches. With regard to the ordinance that is on your agenda today, we suggest that this ordinance be tabled and that no action, either recommending approval or denial to full council, be taken until all of the following can be accomplished. One, direct notification of all affected property owners. This is a very significant undertaking on our island, uh, and an inventory may potentially disclose 10,000 or more properties impacted. Because of this scope, notice by local newspaper of this and other meetings is woefully inadequate to obtain the input of all your fellow islanders that are impacted and that you represent. Two, your consideration of whether this issue may be more appropriately be treated as an overlay to the beachfront zoning district and proper notification of that overlay be given to uh, all residents. Three, you are able, uh, time for you to be able to hear from other experts. What is presented to you certainly contains facts. From those facts come conclusions and proposed actions, and it is important those conclusions, proposed actions be challenged and tested by experts in the field. So for an ordinance that is gonna be as impactful on the residents that you represent. More definitive data collection is needed to accurately define the impact of survival rates on hatchlings due to light source. Other options need also need to be studied that could negate the need for this drastic impact on residents. For example, non-expert uh, uh, suggestions here. Relocation of nests currently take place. Can we relocate additional nests to unlit areas? on our beaches as necessary, additional time and effort, but tremendously less impact on our residents. Second suggestion, can light be blocked at the nest as opposed to at the source? I saw a picture in the present, last presentation that showed a snow fence right in back of a nest. Where an opaque area be placed on the bottom of that snow fence, There'd be no light uh, emanating to that uh, that nest, and uh, uh, we would not have to worry about where the, the light originated. Okay, and that's the three uh, minutes. One more traffic. point. Okay, a uh, last point: enforcement methods and costs substantially impact people, and we need to know what those are and really be studied and detailed before any action is taken. Again, thank you for your service and consideration. Uh, I, I appreciate it, uh, Ken Campbell. Thank you, Ken, appreciate it. All right, uh, the, the next item of unfinished business is a review and recommendation on the Sea Turtle Protection Ordinance, uh, our revisions. Um, Anne, do you have comment, Anne Siren, do you have comments that you would like to make or a presentation? Uh, excuse me. No, sir, I don't have a presentation for you today, but I'd be happy to answer any questions or uh, speak to any issues that the committee would like me to. Well, uh, I have one. Uh, can you summarize the differences in the existing ordinance and the proposed ordinance? Um, sure. There, I, there are a number of differences. I could do um, it. Sorry? Go ahead. Um, there are a number of differences. Um, I, I think for the purposes that people are most concerned about, very generally for exterior lighting, um, what the proposed ordinance states is that all outdoor lighting needs to be, uh, the point source of that light, so the light bulb needs to be covered and downward directed. And, um, for, sorry, I'm just reviewing my documents here. Uh, there are some recommendations for dune lighting changes, construction sites. I think that um, the main concern about indoor lighting had to do with extending the same requirements that we have for second floor uh, windows to the first floor. Um, mm -hmm. Currently the ordinance, which was passed in 1990, states that all new glass doors and windows, so that's new construction as of 1990, should be uh, tinted or have a solar screen installed. And it didn't 
extend that requirement to the first floor of structures. Um, what we're proposing is to extend that requirement to the first floor of structures. And for people who don't want to tint their window, they can use curtains, uh, they can use solar screens, they can turn off their lights, uh, or if they have um, tall windows in their first floor of the structure, if they don't want to use any of that, uh, they can use sea turtle friendly light bulbs as an option. Um, so those are the, those are the main issues, I, I think. Um, there was a change in illumination uh, of the beach to the wording visible from the beach. Why was that done? Sure. So the what the current ordinance states is that it's the goal of the ordinance that no artificial light shall illuminate any areas of the beaches of the island. Um, so that was taken to mean that artificial light shouldn't be so bright that it shines on the sand itself and illuminates the sand. Um, what the current ordinance recommends is what basically the same as the model ordinance in Florida, which is that the measurement instead of using illuminates the sand. Um, a better measurement is to state that artificial light that's visible from the beach, um, the point source of that light should be covered. So not that no artificial light can be seen anywhere on the beach, and that's not what the ordinance states, and that's not the intent of the ordinance. What the proposed ordinance states is that if you have a light source that is visible from the beach on the exterior of the house, uh, that that light, that light bulb will be covered and downward directed. And if it's on the interior of the house that you would use tinted windows, curtains, or turn that particular light bulb off during seasonal nesting season. Okay. Um, I'll have some further comments. So let me let me ask uh, Ms. Becker if she has questions for you. So um, Mr. Campbell brought up a couple of um, points that um, I was interested in. What has been the notification of all property owners with regard to the um, these changes in this ordinance? So when we when staff was directed to undertake this, we started with um, a series of public meetings. We held uh, several meetings with the public and stakeholders. We had uh, three public open house meetings just for anyone in the community to come discuss the meeting and that was held at town hall. And then we had specific meetings for beachfront communities. Um, I contacted all of the communities and invited them to schedule a meeting with me. We had a meeting at Sea Pines, we had a meeting at Port Royal um, and that was held at the um, community houses there. Um, we came, presented at that time what was the proposed ordinance, took questions, took suggestions, and um, I've been updating people who signed up to receive notifications about the process. I've been sending them emails throughout this process of, of upcoming meetings. Um, there have been several articles in the newspaper. I believe the uh, local news uh, has done a few stories on, on the process. So we, we did our best to do public outreach uh, at all of the affected communities at the beginning of the process, and then keep everyone informed throughout the entire process. Was that notification to um, for the public meeting sent directly to homeowners or through the um, community management or POA management? It was sent to the POA management of each of the uh, beachfront communities. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Okay. And then another uh, question that was brought up by uh, Mr. Shelton that um, I'd like a little bit more information on had to do with the criminal um, the consequences, the fines, fees, et cetera, imprisonment that is associated with violations. I can give you some general information. I. My understanding, and this is with several conversations with the uh, assistant town manager, Mr. Gruber, um, is that our enforcement process for a number of years has been based on education and warnings. So we have dual, you know, kind of tracks there. We try to educate uh, the public and visitors and property managers as much as possible before the season starts and throughout the season. Um, and that goes quite a, quite a long way. And then in terms of violations, 
I don't know specifically of any citations that have been issued recently. There may have been some in the past, but I believe the enforcement arm of the process is hanging door, uh, a notification on doorknobs of properties that are in violation uh, of the ordinance and as a warning saying, hey, you know, you might not be aware, here's what the ordinance is. And that's the extent of the enforcement. Uh, we also contact hotels and other properties and the hotel managers are generally very receptive and, and try to educate their guests the best that they can. But um, I, I can't tell you how many citations have been issued. The number is very, very small. And I don't think anyone has ever gone beyond having a citation issued as a part of the enforcement process. So, right, but that potential is there, uh, is, is what I'm hearing. The, and then the uh, broader question you brought up um, is how does this, how would this be enforced? How would this be managed with regard to hotels and um, in that sort of setting? How, where does that where does that line fall? How do how do we take care of that? How do we ensure um, that the hotels are enforcing these rules um, as well? Our code enforcement officers contact the hotels when they notice a violation during the night and speak with the manager and ask them to inform the, their guests about the ordinance. I think due to the size of the hotels and the difficulty of identifying the room or rooms that are in violation, having direct contact with the guests that night is as difficult, but I think that the, it's through education is my understanding. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Becker. Mr. Stanford. Uh, thank you. Uh, this ordinance has been on my agenda for several years now, going back to the time that I was serving on the planning commission before being a member of the town council. And from the beginning, I have raised issues about uh, points in the ordinance that require what I would refer to as retrofitting a home. That is that a property owner must incur expense or darkness for that matter um, in order to comply with the ordinance. And uh, those provisions are excessive from my point of view uh, could likely be unenforceable. That remains to be seen. So I have a, a number of comments or possible suggestions about how we might um, change this ordinance to where it accomplishes the goals we want, but doesn't impose some improper burden uh, on a property owner. All of that is said by someone that has been a citizen full time of this community uh, for 16 years. And I've been coming to this community since I was a teenager. And if you look at me, you can tell that was a long time ago. All of that has to do with the fact that um, I understand, respect and support protection of the sea turtles uh, and the hatchlings from them as an important part of the culture of the town of Hilton Head Island, and I will continue to support that, provided we have reasonable ordinances and restrictions to protect those ordinances. Thank you. I'll speak in more detail in a few minutes. All right. Thank you, Glenn. As I understand it, Anne, from what you said, the differences uh, between the existing ordinance and the proposed ordinance on outdoor lights, the proposed language directs now directs light downward or a property owner guest can turn off the lights at 10 o'clock. Uh, tinted glass are um, with all, all windows on all floors um, for new windows and interior lights, the same language, but now incorporating the first floor with the addition that non-tinted windows above the floor, first floor use long wavelength bulbs uh, or turn off lights at 10 o'clock. I, I took a look at those long wavelength bulbs and I can't imagine that that is a practical alternative. And so at the appropriate time, I would think that that would be something that this 
Public Planning Committee should look at um, uh, in, the, in the next uh, short period of time and in, during this meeting. Uh, I met with the realtors and the builders and I had a very uh, productive meeting. Uh, they asked why window replacements and additions have requirements beyond those of existing houses. In other words, why can't they be subject, subject to the same options um, for mitigating harmful light? And, and I would offer the answer that over time, the goal of this ordinance is to reduce light transmittant uh, glass and to require light transmittant glass uh, along the beach. So the, the conversation then went to, well, what can we do to practically move in that direction, but recognize the expense of uh, some of these ideas? And a compromise would be to do something like, if 50% of the glass area on a facade seen from the beach, condo or hotel is to be replaced, all windows would be replaced within with reduced light transmitting glass. So there is a trigger there of 50%. If it's less than 50%, then the requirement uh, isn't incorporated. The second compromise uh, I think might help, any three-dimensional addition to the house, condo or hotel will be required to have reduced light transmittant glass. Um, that simply means that if there's new construction on a part of the house, it should comply with the reduced light transmittant glass. The other part of the ordinance that is different is the illumination of the beach versus visible from the beach. And in my, uh, opinion, both terms have shortcomings within the ordinance, whether the existing or the proposed. Illumination of the beach simply doesn't recognize what disorients a hatchling. It isn't light on the sand, but a point source of light like the moon, a star, or bright artificial light. Visible from the beach, without further definition, doesn't factor in distance or intensity. So what, what this committee is proposing is that there be uh, additional language that deals with point source of light in order to deal with both of those above factors. This amendment is meant to avoid direct bare bulb light sources that have a higher likelihood of disorientation and beneficially to give homeowners an expensive, inexpensive option to meet the purpose of the ordinance. Also, the language expands the interpretation of visible from the beach. For the purposes of this ordinance, normal translucent fabric lampshades are considered to provide adequate shading of light. And therefore, it would be my recommendation, and if this committee agrees, to add that kind of language so that one of the four options becomes a fifth option to have normal translucent fabric lampshades be a viable way of shading light. Also, um, it was mentioned by um, Mr. Shandlin, reference to candlelight, torchlight, and firelight. I do have to ask the question, if we're defining artificial light, do we really have to include candlelight, firelight, and torchlight? And then, within, as I've already stated, within those parameters of um, the uh, choices uh, for mitigating light, I would add shaded lamps 
um, and so on. My, my conclusion is that we have spent over a year and a half searching for reasonable compromises, and those compromises have been made to achieve the broader goal of the ordinance and to respond to the practical considerations of property owners. I, I think that we each as individuals have to make a determination of what level of personal inconvenience we are willing to have in order to meet the goals of this ordinance. And then secondly, I think that all of us have to recognize that enforcement of any law requires common sense. And I have said this on prior occasions. If you're going one mile above the speed limit down 278, you're not anticipating getting pulled over. If you're doing 25 miles an hour, chances are common sense would say you're going to be pulled over. So with those comments, I would invite um, either Ms. Becker or Mr. Stanford for their further comments. Um. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump in. So, right. The turtles are in many ways, our original native Islanders having come to our shores, um, for more years than any of us have. And so we as humans have an obligation as having more opportunities in life, more ability to adjust and accommodate than um, our friends, the sea turtles. And so I feel compelled that we we're moving in the right direction to say that we're moving in the right direction to do something important. Um, and, and having said that, I'm extremely mindful of the fact that um, I'm a very uncomfortable uh, with the idea of reaching into someone's homes and dictating what it is that they um, are required to do. I'm bothered by the idea that a heavy burden, it seems, is put on those individual property owners um, when it seems less likely that any type of this ordinance would have much effect, if any, on the um, commercial hotels and buildings. That might just relay uh, to us a strong message that as an island, we've allowed buildings to be built too tall, that there are too many um, rooms facing the ocean, perhaps in those buildings, and that they're too close to our ocean, that we can't control something um, and make that work in the broader scheme of being um, good neighbors to all and protectors of those more vulnerable like our sea turtles. I think that the last thing is the idea that while, and, and I think it's a good point, while it's true that education is the major focus of enforcement, and we have all of the caveats of the way we manage things. And I apologize about Harry barking, but he is, this is the trials of working from um, home, I guess. The, um, is that there still stands, I guess, within the code, the opportunities for some more severe um, repercussions and fines and et cetera. And that's bothersome. So as we've worked through the compromises and we've looked at things to make this better over the time that we've been looking at this, some of those points need to also still be refined. Um, and, and, and I think that's important before this becomes an ordinance and, and on our books that we have adjusted what the, um, the fines, et cetera, are. And also, I think one of the things that I heard was have we, have we relied heavily on, have we had 
um, additional expert um, testimony as to all the alternatives that are available. I know everyone has worked hard. I know we have the best of the best looking out for the turtles and, and con our concerns with them. But I am cognizant of the fact that people may feel we didn't necessarily go far enough with regard to other options and considerations. So having said all that, um, I, I, I really would like to see the ordinance go back and consider um, the fines and um, those enforcement measures a bit more. Um, I still think that there's much work to be done with regard to how we have a, an ability to enforce this on everyone um, and not just individual property owners. And so that's right now all I really have to say about it. Thank you, Ms. Becker. Mr. Stanford. Thank you. Um, I express my general uh, approach or feeling about this uh, earlier. Um, it seems to me that the primary objections that we're hearing to this has to do with the changes dealing with interior lighting standards as distinguished from exterior lighting standards. Um, and all of those probably need uh, some further refinement, but I'm going to focus my comments on uh, interior lighting uh, requirements of the draft ordinance and some ideas about changes. Um, and I'm going to be dealing with light fixtures primarily, uh, yet to be determined what to do with things like uh, television screens and uh, candles and torches and flashlights. But if we go through the ordinance, the draft ordinance as is before us right now, the, um, the point that I want to make is focusing on section 8.5-115, uh, which is standards for existing development. It says it is the policy of the town of Hilton Head Island uh, that no artificial light shall illuminate any area of the beaches. That to me is too broad. Uh, I am no scientist and I'm not sure if there's a difference or what the difference is between illuminate and visible. Um, and so we may need to get some help about a better term or we may need to define what that means. But I would suggest there that we say that it is the policy that no, and the word I would insert, unshielded artificial light shall illuminate. If we look at the provisions that go into the, the details of the ordinance in this section, subsection A talks about exterior lights being downward facing. So those are shielded so that the light itself, the light bulb, is not visible. Um, then uh, the other requirements also deal with shielding uh, and being assured that they are mounted in a downward facing uh, fashion. But then if once we get down to subsection F, which is where we're dealing with requiring changes, or as I call them, retrofits to uh, existing structures, after May 1st, 2021, one or more of the following options shall be used so that interior artificial light is less visible, here we say visible, doesn't say eliminate, is less visible uh, from the beach between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. during sea turtle nesting season. Then it goes through uh, what those limitations are, and they are requiring um, opaque, opaque uh, surfaces, blinds, drapes, etc. We've all heard the comments about requiring tinting uh, would violate many of the uh, warranties that go along with these windows, uh, which is the requirement of subsection F2, and then F3 says, well, you can simply turn off the lights. So you have to go to bed at 10 o'clock unless you like to sit around in the darkness afterwards. 
uh, that is a excessive uh, invasion of our privacy as I see it. But then we get down to the exceptions to those requirements. And here we say windows located on the first floor that extend into the second floor or above, which is a clarification, or windows that are above the first floor shall be exempt from the requirements of this provision if all interior lights that are visible from the beach, and again, we don't say illuminate the beach, here we talk about visible from the beach, um, use only the uh, restrictive light bulbs of uh, whatever all of that scientific uh, language means. To me, a, another way to look at this would be going through that language again, uh, windows located on the first floor, et cetera, um, are exempt if all interior light, and here I would insert bulbs, tubes, or other sources of light that are visible from the beach are shielded, here we're picking up on the language that David Ames gave, are shielded with translucent lampshades limiting visibility of the sources of light or use the restricted light bulbs and so forth. And then to go for, further and clarify uh, for purposes of this ordinance, normal translucent fabric light sh shades are, cons are considered to provide adequate dispersal of light. So what those changes do is they are intended at least to block visibility of the light bulb or the light source, but allow people to continue to use and occupy their homes. That is, it does not impose to me an excessive um, obligation uh, to uh, either turn off their lights or incur additional funds to make their homes uh, sea turtle friendly. Uh, rather, it just says use light shades, folks. The, the current ordinance has been there for a long time. Um, the current ordinance does not apply uh, to the first floor. This would extend the provisions of the ordinance to the first floor uh, and prohibit exposed light bulbs and the light and the like, but would continue to prevent to allow uh, lights that have lampshades on them. It seems to me that this um, type of approach is fair to all concerned. And uh, David, I would like at the appropriate time uh, to be able to move um, that uh, this committee recommend referral back of this ordinance to the staff to consider implementing provisions similar to those that you, uh, Ms. Becker, and I have recommended here today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Glenn. Um, good work. Um, and yes, I, I would like to go in that direction. But first, I want to ask Ann. Uh, the issue of experts was raised. We've been working on this now for over a year and a half. I presume that in addition to Amber Kuhn, who is a marine biologist and committed her uh, professional life to dealing with turtles, that uh, staff has inquired and received information from other experts. Is that accurate? Yes, sir, it is. Can you give some examples? Certainly. Um, we relied primarily on the what's considered the best um, scientific publication in the field, uh, which is a technical report uh, that was written by Blair Witherington. Um, that was mentioned, I think, in the workshop yesterday and is the basis for, I, I believe, much of the uh, Florida model ordinance, uh, which is used throughout the state of Florida. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, that you weren't the expert on fines and criminal cases and so on. Unfortunately, today we do not have our assistant town 
uh, deputy town manager or our staff uh, attorney available because of uh, court appearances. Um, it's my understanding, and boy, I did sure am out on a limb on this one, is that the only way we can proceed to enforce this is through a criminal case as opposed to a civil. Now, I, <laughs> I'm probably wrong on that, but I, I have asked the question, why do we have to go to uh, uh, criminal fines on another ordinance? Uh, and I was given the answer that I just spoke of. So I, I think that's definitely something that we need to confirm with our legal staff and uh, uh, have that be answered. Um, on the tenting, we continue to hear that you lose your um, uh, guarantee or warranty uh, if you put tenting on. Uh, I, I think that's probably accurate to the extent that the warranty is in place, but I don't know if it's five years or 10 years uh, that you do lose that warranty in any case. Um, so I, I think that there are always going to be uh, some disadvantages in uh, establishing a new ordinance, and I think that's where we are uh, on this one. Uh, reaching into a home uh, gives us a uncomfortable feeling, but if the lights emanate from that house have an impact on a natural resource, in this case turtles, isn't it reasonable to try to mitigate that impact in one way or another? And truly, that's all we're trying to do. It's, it's not draconian uh, to the extent that now we have an inexpensive alternative to dealing with it, uh, with a light source in a house. So I, I, I think that um, we, we really truly are at a point where the 1990 ordinance, for a lot of purposes, is exactly the same as what's being proposed here. But the advancements in understanding of uh, turtle biology, uh, how their light, how their eyes work, and so on, all have a role to play in our updating this ordinance. And clearly, uh, we have challenges uh, along the beachfront in terms of enforcement and education. And I am equally uh, committed to dealing with those two as I am to have this ordinance uh, adopted as um, a part of our, our uh, commitment to the environment here on Hilton Head. So Glenn, uh, I, I would like you to make your motion, but I would like to also ask if if uh, you and Ms. Becker agree for staff to look into the 50% compromise and also the addition um, language that I'm proposing. Um, the 50% of the glass area of a facade seen from the beach, condo, or hotel is to be replaced. If it is to be replaced, all windows will re be replaced with reduced light transmittent glass. And then any three-dimensional addition to the house, condo, or hotel will be required to have reduced light transmittent glass. I think those two items point to a long-term goal of minimizing light leakage on the beach for the benefit of the turtles. Would you be willing to add those two to your, your uh, motion? I'm happy to if I can remember how to state them. So, well, Mr. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I would I would move that uh, we refer this ordinance uh, back to staff uh, to study and possibly incorporate the changes and provisions that have been discussed here today, including uh, clarifying visibility versus illumination. Uh, in including uh, the various uh, refinements of the restrictions on interior lighting in a structure facing the beach uh, to include possibly 
shielding with light shades for lighting fixtures that um, are found on the first floor, uh, which would be the, the changes in the new ordinance, and to incorporate provisions as suggested uh, by the chairman uh, dealing with um, alteration of the facade of the house uh, to uh, by more than 50% of the uh, light surfaces or the window surfaces rather including doors that would be facing the beach and uh, to include possible restrictions on three-dimensional changes um, to a structure meaning construction of an addition uh, to an existing home. That's as simple um, as I can make it. Thank you. <laughs> I, if you would be willing to amend that, I think uh, a definition of point source of light should be uh, included. Yes, I certainly agree with that amendment. Okay, thank you. Ms. Becker, are you willing to second? I'll second it, yes. All right, thank you. If there's no further discussion, all the, and, uh, Theresa, I think you should call the roll on this one. Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stanford? For the motion. Ms. Becker? Yes, for the motion. Mr. Ames? For the motion. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate that. It's been a long time coming, and I'm optimistic that we will have a draft back for our next meeting. Thank you. All right. David, I have another comment, if I might. You may, of course. I am uh, ignorant of what a 560 nanometer light does, if that's the right terminology. I think that we should see a demonstration of uh, such a restricted or such a limited light source and what it means. Um, and we also should see a significant demonstration of what um, the turtle friendly uh, glass does versus what ordinary glass does. So good, we understand good. what this, it is we're looking at. This is the uh, light bulb and it's rouge, it's red. You can get turtle friendly light bulbs that are yellow. They're, in my opinion, uh, inappropriate for interior use, and uh, but it would be a personal choice if somebody wanted to do that. So. It would be an interesting interior decorating idea to have pink light bulbs throughout the house. Yeah. Well, thank you for those comments. All right. New business. Discussion of the parking master plan, and we're lucky to have Mr. Liggett with us today to make a presentation. Yes, sir. Good uh, afternoon to you and the rest of the uh, the committee. Also, I know I'm joined here on the call by several other town staff who may jump in as this discussion uh, continues. Um, insofar as an introduction, you all no doubt will recall that uh, representatives from Walker Consultants, the town's uh, consultant that completed our parking study, provided a presentation to the full council here on October 27th. At the conclusion of that presentation, the mayor tasked the public planning committee with identifying items, presumably within the consultant's recommendations for identification for further discussion at your workshop, currently planned to occur there in late January. So my reminder to the group would be that our real task, whether it's completed today in its entirety, or we need subsequent meetings to accomplish that, is to identify those things um, related to this parking study that would be discussed further for uh, potential policy agenda inclusion um, for the upcoming year. And you all may recall, if you'll indulge me, I'll try to share my screen here. <clears throat> there were six specific recommendations for immediate action items that uh, the folks from Walker recommended and if only for a reminder, I would like to pull up here on my screen what those six specific items were. I will tell you um, there are two of those six items that I would recommend rise to the level of consideration 
for the committee for placement on the council's workshop agenda. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Barely. Okay. And so, and so this is literally... Can you make it any larger? Can I make it any larger? Let me yes. see. Is that better? That's good. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's much very better. much better. Thank you. <laughs> So, so what this is, is uh, page uh, two of the task four deliverable, which you can see is entitled uh, immediate action items. And uh, let me uh, breeze through here these six um, to start with. And these were identified by Walker, I, I, as I understand it, in no particular order, priority or chronology. Uh, the first item that they identified was the establishment of a parking enterprise fund of course, this would seem to presume that some level of parking uh, structure or fee was uh, instituted. And by structure, I mean a framework for uh, rates to be applied to town facilities. The second recommendation was uh, what they entitled Town Code uh, Title 12 Motor Vehicles. Um, and this, frankly, is, is uh, one of the areas, I think, of initial focus that is very important um, and this effectively would be the institution of a uh, structured fee that would apply as was identified by Walker. And this was just their recommendation to all of our facilities. Um, you'll recall that they had identified um, both venue specific rates as well as some seasonal adjustments. Uh, there was an item they identified as parking fine ordinance uh, and this relates to uh, changes to the, the town code that would be uh, recommended or necessary should we advance this program. Similarly, there were recommendations for parking enforcement ordinance, a vehicle immobilization policy, and the last one is the residential parking district policy. And of these six items, the two that I would recommend uh, that bear further discussion and frankly could be considered uh, the first dominoes to fall uh, to my way of thinking are this town code revision that deals with the establishment of uh, the, the parking uh, fee to begin with. And clearly we can talk uh, further um, about the actual rates, how they may apply based on venue or location, how they may be adjusted seasonally if council wants to, uh, to engage that. And the other item that I would recommend uh, be discussed is the residential parking district policy. Uh, and there was the notion that there is the potential uh, for, for some sort of parking district or districts to be established that would provide uh, on-street parking. Uh, and this may be one of the things that uh, I feel most strongly about, that in many of the areas that were identified, um, Forest Beach, uh, Bradley Beach area, Folly Field, Hall and Mitchellville, the notion that we either own the roads, have room to provide on-street parking safely, and that the regulations, namely the land management ordinance allows those to occur, all are at odds with that structure. Uh, and what I would suggest is that we talk about instituting no parking districts um, as may be needed in and around any of the town's uh, beach parking lots, which were the, the, uh, the subject of the study. There is also one other recommendation that I would make as it relates to an item that was not identified by Walker, but I do believe is germane and is linked back to any rate structure that we may discuss. And that has to do with the current resident parking pass policy. You all may be familiar that the town currently has a program whereby we, we provide <clears throat> two year passes to island residents and property owners at a rate of $15 per year that allows them to park at any of our <clears throat> facilities without incurring additional charges. And that's a fee that has uh, been in place and remained unchanged for the last 27 years. Um, I would suggest that as we consider um, instituting a, a uniform rate elsewhere that we revisit uh, the viability of that program and consider uh, bringing it up to 2020 context, or alternatively consider the potential to provide um, 
free of charge resident parking passes, assuming that uh, one, we don't do two things, that we don't um, upset and create a demand that cannot be managed. You know, we have a significant oversubscription right now. Um, we need to make sure at least that we're confident we, we don't um, upset that further. Um, and that we need to, uh, to ensure that the rate structure, whatever we may settle into, um, can fully subsidize that program. And I also would suggest that it would be helpful to, uh, to uh, best define or lock in what we consider residents to be. Um, I think it would be helpful to staff as we administer that program, regardless of what we do, whether we maintain the, the $15 a year fee, whether it is increased or reduced, or whether it becomes a gratis program. And so that, that would be my recommendation for uh, candidate agenda items for your workshop. The establishment of a, a parking uh, fee schedule, uh, a revisitation of the resident parking pass policy, and a discussion regarding the residential parking districts as proposed by the consultant. Thank you, Scott. Ms. Becker? Do you have uh, questions, comments? Um, I, I, I don't have, um, well, let me just ask, do we currently, how do we currently define residents? The, well, the, the intent is for us to provide passes to folks that can demonstrate that they either own property or are residents here on the island. Where we have, have found some difficulties, we may have folks that own property and have, let's say, a corporate interest you know, company cars and whatnot that may uh, have an address point that is a commercial address. Gotcha. Um, those have proved to be challenging. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's a, I figured that's what you were talking about. Um, I think that uh, Scott has pointed to a couple of the most important pieces here. And um, I particularly liked the concept of rathering parking district policy, realizing that many of the situations um, just aren't conducive to quality of life and safety of our um, residents and visitors, that a no parking district policy is, is equally as desirable. So um, that's all I have to say right now. And for Thank what you. it's worth, the, the old program, or I guess I should say the current program, has been administered with the notion that we do have no parking districts, mostly in and around the areas where we have our beach parks, because one of the behaviors that tends to occur, particularly where uh, charges have been instituted, folks seemingly to avoid those charges have drifted into uh, to neighborhoods to, to park on the cheap, so to speak. And we do need to be mindful, regardless of what we settle into, that there very well could be demand changes or behavior changes that may suggest that additional actions on the part of the town or others may be warranted um, based on how folks react to any um, parking uh, rate structure we institute. Thank you. Glenn? Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say that I was very impressed with the details and creative notions that came from this parking study. Uh, the highlight to me was the fact that it appears that if we adopt a program like this, it will be self-supporting and in fact profitable so that it can generate additional revenue for the benefit of the town in improving our uh, parking situation. So that's just outstanding. When they refer to the enterprise fund, I think what they're really talking about is what are the parking fees going to be and where are they going to go? And uh, interestingly, the $4 per hour during the high season and $2 per hour during the off season has generated to me uh, complaints that that's too high and complaints that that's too low. So it may mean that's just about right. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that we need to discuss exactly what those fees are to be charged to non-residents moving forward. Then I am concerned about the limitation of two hours permitted to park 
with the opportunity to extend for one hour. I don't think that represents the normal use of uh, the beaches, particularly in the high season. And I think we need to discuss whether we should have the $4 prime season rate and possibly a daily rate as well, which would be a little bit more than, say, five or six hours times $4. But I think that's an item to be discussed about whether limiting it to just three hours is practical um, and whether it is too restrictive uh, on, on the use of the beaches. Um, you didn't mention uh, the fact that the um, consultant recommends opening up um, the Islanders Beach Park. Uh, as I may be confused about this, but my understanding was that that would be treated in the same way as every other beach parking lot. Um, and I think we might have a revolution of citizens if we do that. Uh, it doesn't trouble me now that I understand it, that we have some limited parking spaces down there for non-residents. Uh, but it does bother me that uh, we're talking about uh, changing uh, this existing use of the Islanders Beach Park, and the council uh, needs to be discussing that. Another idea that's been uh, presented to me, which I think we should discuss, is whether or not we should offer some sort of parking pass, for lack of a better term, uh, to residents of Beaufort County. Um, I really don't know exactly how I feel about that, but I would be interested in a debate that says, uh, that says, all right, for an annual fee of, pick a number, $100 a year, $75 a year, you will get the same sort of treatment for parking that a resident gets uh, for parking here at the island beaches. Um, if you get beyond Beaufort County, um, I don't have the same feelings that maybe we should even consider that. But I think it is worthy of, uh, of some further uh, consideration. Um, the towing and immob immobilization of vehicles is always a sensitive thing. I think we've had a pretty rational way to deal with that. Uh, currently, we probably will continue with that. Um, lastly, um, I would, and I mentioned this before, I would really like to hear uh, the actual experience of other communities that have been using similar systems. I have the impression, but not the knowledge, that in fact this um, menu of options that's given to us by the consultant brings together all of the modern concepts, and he didn't give us anyone that has done all of those concepts. Some of those things have been done in some communities and some have been done by others. And so if there's someone that has taken the full bite, we'd like to know what their experience has been. And regardless, I would like to know what other beach communities' uh, experiences have been. And uh, I, for one, if I can be provided with the names or contact information of who to reach out to at uh, other communities up and down the coast, I'm happy to make some phone calls and find out and come back and report to the group. So I am uh, enthusiastic about this idea, uh, particularly since it can take a burden off of you, Scott, <laughs> and off of the entire town and convert something that is uh, an annoyance uh, into a profit center for the benefit of the island. Uh, I think that's great. What would happen with those profits, um, if any, uh, would be uh, would have to be dealt with in the future, obviously. The last thing I would comment on is that I simply don't recall what, if any, use the consultant was talking about about the USCB campus here on the island. 
that parking lot that is not highly used in the summertime and how that would be treated. Uh, so that's another resource, if you will, asset that we have here uh, that needs to be included in the mix. Uh, and maybe a remote lot like that would have a lower fee to create an economic incentive. So I'm very positive about these ideas. I want to see council develop them, and I hope we can have some aspect of it in place next summer. Thank you. Scott, um, let's imagine for a second that uh, at the end of January, at the end of the retreat, we agree that resident permits and fees uh, ought to be studied further um, as priorities. Is it, in your opinion, realistic to assume that something can be implemented in 2021? Or are we still a year away? I think we still may be a year away. I think the, the expectation is that one of the benefits that the program that was identified has that it, it can be as flexible as we would like it to be as it relates to the, the payment options and the um, hours and the structures and the rates. But it, it seems to me that we may have too much infrastructure to put in place from a, a, a financial collection standpoint. Uh, from the standpoint of hiring a concessionaire or a vendor or a franchisee to work on our behalf to collect those monies, to remit them, to engage in enforcement such that the, the program we envision at its height could be implemented um, by this summer. That seems a bit ambitious to me. Yeah, that's, that's my instinctive reaction because as soon as you say you're going to introduce a fee, then you need somebody collecting it, you need to have somebody checking it on it, and so on and so forth. And, you know, we, we probably ought to be setting up the enterprise fund at the same time to receive the money, so that's another uh, hurdle. So I guess where I, I come out on that part of my comment is uh, what could be worked in the short period of time between now and April to increase capacity of spaces. Um, uh, they did recommend USCB that talked about the churches and they talked about a number of different places. Um, is, is that something that staff should be working on right now to uh, make recommendations at our retreat um, to get councils guidance on whether something like that ought to be implemented. Yeah, and I, and I think within those, um, within that context, the potential expansion or very least the maintenance of the shuttle program that relied on those remote lots and potentially other town properties that may with, be within striking distance. Um, you know, we could examine those for potential um, expansion of that program. One of the things that has been a fact with respect to the beachgoers of course, with all of the paraphernalia that now seems to be part of going to the beach, the, the greater uh, distance and more inconvenient you make for folks to log all that stuff on to some sort of shuttle, you kind of end up uh, d defeating the purpose, so to speak, of providing it in the first place. But those are the type yeah. of things that I would tend to agree that, that are potentially ripe for discussion. Yeah, and, and that begs the question, uh, what's our attitude towards uh, uh, restricting or prohibiting tents uh, because it's a uh, refuse nightmare. Um, and so I, I, I don't know how we get a hold of all of these things, but in, in my lexicon, it's a beach, overall beach management plan that we need to be thinking about. And we're just talking about one segment of that regarding fees, for instance, for parking. Um, I, I would recommend that as we move forward with a fee proposal that that we have options that the community can look at and say ooh ooh that one hurts me or i like that one so that it's not one size fits all but we're giving the community the merchants the businesses the residents uh, a way of evaluating what might be most attractive uh, for them. I'd also uh, suggest that staff begin as soon as possible doing, to the degree that it can, 
sort of monthly statistics on where people are parking. The reason I, I mention this is that in a meeting that I had with some merchants around the Caligny area, it was stated that really there are only 14 or 18 highest demand days where things really get out of control. Uh, and that's sort of the uh, do we build the church uh, for Easter concept. Uh, or, or put a different way, how do we manage uh, in anticipation for those highest demand days? Um, I think that uh, the comment that um, uh, Glenn mentioned, whether or not we should be thinking about extending uh, courtesy to the residents of Beaufort County, I think that's worth a conversation. Obviously, though, if we couple that with uh, making uh, resident passes free, uh, we're only complicating our capacity issues uh, that much further. And to the extent that we make it the beaches too available, I think we are really opening the door to a lot of very unhappy people who drive to the beach. So there's a communication plan that's necessary that relies on technology. And so I, I think we take one step at a time. However, having said that, if somebody lives in Bluffton and spends 40 hours a week on Hilton Head working, then I think there some, should be some consideration for that person. So uh, the second part of that equation with a fee is if we look at resident um, as a revenue resource uh, to help pay this enterprise fund and everything that goes under it, then some people are going to have a greater capacity to afford it than others. And I just think we have to think through that as well. Um, I'll weigh in on the parking district policy versus no parking district policy. I think we have to protect our residents' quality of life. And so the residential neighborhoods really have to be protected. And so I, I based on what I've heard you say, I think we've had the right policy in place. Um, I think that everything begins to act, beg the question, how many people are going to be able to be accommodated on our beaches based on the infrastructure that we have available, the desire we have to accommodate everybody, and the uh, brand experience that we think is important to the bottom line for businesses and for property values. So I think this is a big, big issue. And I, I, I understand what you're trying to accomplish, Scott, by paring down our alternatives. And I think you've chosen the two that we should concentrate on in the near term. Any further thoughts by council? I just have um, I, I, I just have two. One of the overall concerns that I have um, from the presentation, I think I made it the day of the workshop, um, but I'm, I guess I just keep saying it, is that it, it, with, in, the, in the program there were signs, lots of signs and directions, and, and those, I don't believe, are really consistent with um, the Hilton Head environment. And so I would be um, not only very reluctant, I would be very opposed at adding um, any additional signage um, throughout our island <coughs> indicating parking um, availability, et cetera, at various places and having that as a rotating sign even worse. Um, and while there were many comments that um, that got made and this was a great discussion i think one of the things that i probably should say also is if it, there's been a lot of talk about this being a revenue generator for the island not necessarily i think had thought of it in that way um i thought of it differently but if it were to become a revenue generator of um, any significance 
I believe first thing that should be done with those revenues is to relieve the residents of the island um, of those parking pass fees so that they no longer um, have to do those two year passes. That would be my desire. So I think this is a conversation that's ongoing. Um, I look forward to it and I thank you, Scott, because I too think you hit on, on the two important areas to focus on. So. Glenn? I just want to again thank Scott for again giving a thorough and thoughtful presentation. Uh, I hope you got the kind of input that you needed today in order to help us move this program forward. Thank you, Scott. Yes, sir, you're welcome. Scott, uh, two, two final thoughts. Uh, I think the whole experience for both residents and guests and day trippers heavily depends on technology and how you give people sort of up to the minute uh, indications of spaces available. If I'm driving from Pooler, um, I want to know early on whether or not I'm going to find a parking place. Uh, and I think it minimizes the likelihood that we're going to have people trying to park in front, front of people's property or on people's property and so on. So I, I just want to emphasize the sooner we get a, uh, somebody on board to think through a technology master plan for beach access, I think the better off we'll be. The second comment uh, has to do with what Tammy just said, um, a revenue source. Um, the, the, the first line of uh, rationale is that we ought to be charging enough so that we don't incur additional expenses on our residents' behalf, uh, that our infrastructure, uh, security forces, beach shore, clean up management and so on and so forth are being, uh, expenses are being shared with others who come to the island. But, you know, if you, if you think of this uh, beach experience as in a way similar to the hospitality tax. Hospitality tax is a 2% uh, fee on top of preferred food and beverage, and it goes to infrastructure as well as other things on the island. Uh, I haven't thought this through, but the the enterprise fund uh, could also be a way of improving the quality of our infrastructure and the enhancing the experience of guests and residents. So it has potential because it is such a resource in demand. And so I think we should be thinking through how we leverage that, not only for residents' benefit, but, but also for the quality of experience for guests as well. So I yes, appreciate your time. And uh, if there's no further business, uh, are there any staff reports that you're aware of, Scott, or from anybody else? Mr. Chairman, no reports from staff. Oh, all right. Thank you, Teresa. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Okay. All those in favor, raise your right hand. You got Thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Adjourn. Thank you. Good meeting.